Thank you, Julie, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, we've had lots of conversations thus far. It's been amazing, um, you know, and, and I guess it's a good uh, segue for us uh, in terms of our conversation that we're about to have. And, you know, we as digital citizens are kind of known for this on-off relationship that we have with big, big tech, right? And they've obviously made uh, some attempts in terms of self-governance. Um, so, you know, in, in today's session, I just really want everyone to give a warm uh, woman in AI ethics uh, welcome to uh, the executive director uh, of Internet Without Borders, an inaugural member of uh, the Facebook Oversight Board, and a practitioner and a fellow civil society uh, lab at Stanford. Um, so yeah, let's give a big welcome to Julie Owano. Um, so I guess my first question to Julie uh, is around big tech um, and their self-governance that they've had up to date um, in terms of uh, or also including things like the oversight boards. And um, you know, what has been the purpose and the objective for Facebook oversight board? Thank you very much, Lavina, and uh, congratulations to Women in AI Ethics for this uh, wonderful event. And I'm really glad to be here and talk to you this morning, my time. Um, so what is the Facebook Oversight Board? It's a, it's a new body, a uh, new institution in the building uh, that was set to, to make moderation, I mean, not moderation decisions, that was set to make decisions on content moderation decisions made by Facebook and Instagram. So two of the new meta uh, company, uh, two of the, the, the meta, um, I mean, part of the meta group. And uh, how do we do that? We do that based on appeals that are law, well, that are filed by users. So if you're a user, you're not happy because one of your content has been taken down, you can appeal to the oversight board. Or if you are a user and you see something that shouldn't be on the platform, hate speech, disinformation, or anything else, you can also appeal to the board. And, and I insist on that because it's, it's something that many people were expecting the board to work on and we're, we're now working on, on those type of cases. And last but not least, the company itself can refer cases to us. So when they have problems applying their own community standards, so these are the rules that apply to their platform, what you're allowed or not to do on Facebook and Instagram, well, they can send those cases to you. But we, not, we don't only make decisions, we also make recommendations. The decisions are binding, that it means um, it means that if we tell Facebook, well, in this case, you should put that content back up or you should take that content down, Facebook has to do it. Uh, in addition to those binding decisions, we also make recommendations. And those recommendations, although non-binding, are, I think, a very powerful tool that can help us set precedent on the one hand, because we want to make sure that whatever decision that we make is going to be helpful and impactful beyond the individual case that we're working on. And so those recommendations, although not binding, nevertheless, the company must respond to those recommendations, responding by saying, we either will fully implement it or we will not implement it or we will partially implement it. And I would say that even when the company doesn't want to implement, it gives a lot of information with regards to where maybe civil society organizations, citizens, and even governments should look more into uh, and, and see where the problems are. So yes, this is what the Facebook Oversight does. We are 20 uh, members from all around the world, including uh, Taiwan, including Indonesia, the United States, uh, France, the UK, Cameroon, and, and so many other places around the world. And that I think speaks to, or tries to speak as much as possible to the diversity of the user base of Facebook and Instagram. And uh, yes, we'll probably get more into that, but this is basically the broad presentation of what the Facebook oversight does. I love it because it means that you're making a board very accessible, right? And anyone can actually approach you, uh, which is brilliant. So I think, uh, you know, my follow on question would be how and when did you actually join uh, Meta slash Facebook Oversight Board? I don't know if I should call it Meta Oversight or Facebook Oversight, but yeah. I, I have to say that we're struggling ourselves, but, you know, <laughs> referring to the company, the company, the group at least has changed the name. So it, it's, we try to use Meta when we talk about the group, which is actually more convenient because we used to struggle before when we were talking about the group instead of just the social media it was kind of tricky. But yes, 
well, anyway, call it how you want, but the Facebook or Meta of a sideboard, I joined it last year on May the 6th when it was launched officially 20, in 2020, uh, along with, I can name a few, a few people, uh, Nigat Dad, who's also a very prominent activist from the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Alan Rosebridger, who used to be the editor-in-chief of The Guardian until recently, um, Helle Thorning Schmidt, who is uh, the former prime minister of Denmark. She's uh, one of our co-chairs because we, are, we have four co-chairs, including uh, Michael McConnell, professor here at Stanford Law School, um, Professor Jamal Green, who's professor of uh, constitutional law at um, uh, Columbia, and uh, Professor Catalina Botero, who uh, who is a professor in um, in, the, in Colombia? I'm sorry, I have a, a blank here with regards to her institution of affiliation. And she used to be a former special rapporteur on freedom of expression uh, for the um, the American Court of Human Rights, uh, Inter American Court of Human Rights. So yes, these are different people uh, with whom I've had the great pleasure and honor. I have frankly have to say uh, to, to to work with in the past uh, in the past year. We've just released our transparency report, which I'm also happy to to walk folks through in the conversation. Brilliant. Can I ask a follow-on question in terms of uh, the board itself? Um, you know, we kind of curious beings. Um, so is this very much a paid for or is this a volunteer role? It's a paid for position. Um, I must say that we're not paid by Facebook, if that's your question uh, with regards <laughs> to the independence. We are fully independent from the company. It might seem counterintuitive because it is true that Facebook at the time it was named Facebook, had the idea and put in the money to make it happen. But they put it in an in a ind independent trust that they have, that the company has zero control on. And uh, we, are, we report to that trust, uh, which has also trustees. Uh, we report to them. We, yeah, we, we have to justify to someone and that someone is not Mark Zuckerberg, that someone is not someone from Facebook. So yes, it's a paid for position. We work at least, well, contractually, we're committed to work 15 hours a week, but honestly, it's more than that. Because what we've realized is that the cases, the, the mission itself is so, in my, that's my personal opinion, but I'm sure my colleagues would share it. It's very passionate. And, uh, and it's very difficult for you to say, oh, I've reached my 15 hours a week and I'm just going to you know, close my laptop. It doesn't really work like that. So it's, a, it's a, yes, it's a paid position, but we work really hard uh, to, uh, to, yeah, to fulfill the mission that's beyond our individualities and even beyond the board itself, <laughs> I must say. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, you know, moving on in terms of, you know, uh, boards being very much either controversial or you know, uh, still out on jury if they're effective or not, especially when it comes to tech giants and us holding them accountable. What have been some of the most recent decisions that have been made by the board uh, in terms of uh, Facebook uh, that they were then recommended or required to actually follow? Yes, thank you so much for asking this. Uh, we've just, as I said, we've just published our first ever transparency report, which covered different quarters, because normally we're supposed to make quarterly reports, but we wanted to wait to have a critical mass uh, of information before sharing it to the public. So this, uh, this report covered from October 2020 to June or July 2021. And uh, we received half a million demands for appeal. Uh, we, of course, cannot, you know, satisfy all of these. But like you said, uh, we make a lot of recommendations and those recommendations impact beyond the case that we're working on and impact the policies themselves. I'll share a few examples. One of the, one of the cases that we received was uh, a case from India where uh, a content was deleted uh, by the company for alleged, allegedly violating the dangerous individuals and, and uh, uh, organizations policy. You may know that Facebook and Instagram do not allow certain organizations to be present on the platform. For instance, the Taliban's, this is one of the most famous examples. Uh, and you're not even allowed to praise, as a, as a user, you're not allowed to praise those. And so that content was taken down for allegedly praising a dangerous organization. Um, it, well, we thought we disagreed with the organization, with company, sorry, with the company. And we um, asked the company to restore the content. But what we realized working on the case is that the community standards, so these are the rules 
apply to everyone. We're not available, we're available in English, many other languages, but not in Punjabi, which is one of the most spoken languages around the world and probably one of the most important user bases of Facebook. And so that didn't make any sense. And we recommended the company to, well, do what it's supposed to do. You want to you have billions of users. You want to make sure that all these users understand what they're allowed or not to do. So they committed to translate those by the end of this year, uh, if I remember well. We've also worked on the recent case that involved, um, that was related to the conflict that happened earlier this year in the Gaza, uh, in the Gaza area and uh, between Israel and Palestine. It concerned a publication by, so what happened was that Al Jazeera, which is a media, which is fact-checked, which is, which is even cross-checked, I'll get to that also. Um, and that, that account posted a report of the Al Qassam Brigade, another dangerous organization not allowed on Facebook. So the Al Qassam Brigade was warning of war crimes against the Israeli army in response to um, bombings. And one user from Egypt simply reposted the publication and made a comment saying, ooh, oh. So the Facebook took it down. And uh, what we learned during the, the investigation, because we do ask questions to the company, we also ask questions to the public. We have a public comment period for every cases that we work on. So any one of you here, any organization can submit public comments to help the board make its, make its decision. And so we found out that First of all, the content had been moderated in quite a very weird way. It went first to an Arabic speaker, then it went to another non-Arabic speaker in Asia. I mean, the, the, the routing was very uh, interesting in terms of understanding the moderation process internally. And uh, on top of that, we were very surprised that to learn, thanks to submissions by organization, to learn that there was a unit, spe specific unit, Put, uh, put out by the government, the Israeli government, to basically flag content that allegedly violates community, community standards, flag them to Facebook, so that the Facebook, the company, Meta, can take it, take it down or leave it up, whatever they decide. And so this was extremely interesting because it, it, it's not that much in the public eye, uh, but thanks to the, the comment that we received from this organization, and thanks to the well, to the work that we did internally, we were able to recommend the company that it should be transparent on the request, on the units it works with and the type of request, of the request, sorry, it receives from this type of units. And this is something that the company has agreed to do. Uh, and last but not least, there were alleged, people are alleging, reports alleging that there was a bias in the moderation of Facebook against Palestinian content. We've asked the company to uh, conduct an independent in investigation into that, audit its moderation system and potential bias. And the company accepted to, uh, to, to do that, I believe by, by well, in the, in the next few months. So uh, yes, these are some examples. And I, I mentioned, I mentioned cross-check, very famous now. It wasn't when the board asked questions about it in the Trump decision. Um, if you recall, the former president's, the U.S. president account had been suspended for, following the January the 6th uh, riots. And um, we were asked to tell Facebook whether or not it, had, it was right to do so. And when we did our investigations, we asked questions about whether or not the president's account was, uh, had another moderation process that was not similar to what you and me would have you know, as normal user. And uh, they responded that they do have a separate, you know, moderation channel for kind of VIP accounts, which the president's, uh, former president's account was part of. Uh, but they, well, they, it, it was, it was, it seemed as if it concerned just a few accounts, but we've learned through investigations. And I'm really happy that organizations, activists, whistleblowers feel, it, well, encouraged also by the work of the board because well, this, this cross-check program was part of the series of revelations that were made by the Wall Street Journal and later on by whistleblower Francis Hogan about, you know, the, the fact that this concerned more than just a few accounts, but actually millions of accounts. So um, we, we, we did uh, flag the, this, uh, and now this, um, this program is sitting on the other side board's desk for review. We were asked by the company to provide policy advisory guidance uh, to, to help them shape a, a policy that's more respectful of our human rights. Wow, there's definitely so much that you guys are up to. Yes. <laughs> I'm in awe. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we've obviously seen Facebook make a lot of headlines of late, right? Uh, and, you know, is this an attribution or is this one of the measures that you guys have then put in place in terms of holding them actually accountable or responsible uh, for their actions? Um, I think, I mean, that's our mission, right? We uh, want to make sure the company is accountable and is more transparent on its moderation processes, which were until very recently quite secret. We didn't know that much. Uh, and, I, and personally, being the, the, the head of an organization that has been working for so many years, warning the companies, because you know, moderation is not just about taking down, living up. It's really about democracy now. We are seeing increasingly governments discuss the negative impact of big tech and particularly of, of, of Facebook and Instagram um, against democracy. But I would go even further. That danger started even before in countries where internet is shut down, but not just not the whole internet. Increasingly, it's only Facebook, Twitter, YouTube that are shut down, but they are shut down allegedly to fight fake news and, and hate speech, which are real problems. But the fact that these problems are not addressed by the companies because, you know, it happens in India, it happens in Mozambique, it happens, you name it, somewhere where we, we don't risk regulation. We're not scared of regulation as a tech company. Well, this threatens freedom of expression around the world and democracy. And my organization, for someone who's been working on this for so long and trying to make the link between the dangers for free expression and democracy and actually fighting those problems, those, those scourges on, on the spaces that have been so helpful around the world. Well, I have learned a lot sitting on the other side board. I've learned so much about the, the, the companies themselves. This is something that we don't know when we're a civil, civil society organization, not in the US, but at 12,000 kilometers from here, I was in France. I was in France and there's a lot of things that I didn't know. So imagine organizations in, in Kathmandu, they, they, they will be even more lost than I am. So um, this is, I mean, this, that's why it's important for us to make sure that those companies and Facebook particularly and Instagram are more transparent, but being transparent in a way that is actually helpful for the users, for the organizations trying to hold them accountable for the governments as well, and make sure that we all speak the same language because it's very easy for big tech to you know, lose us with some very technical jargon and you know makes make it as if it's what it, if it were very complicated when in fact it would just require a few, a few a little bit of dialogue a little bit of collaboration a little bit of transparency uh to to address uh the the, the issue so i i i, I don't want to say we will solve everything i i don't think that and it would be you know preposterous to think so uh, but like the, the the previous panelists, I truly believe that the solutions will mirror the internet. The internet is interconnections. So there's no way only one connection will have the solution. We all can bring in part of the solution and we can all work together to make sure that this space, this public space, I truly believe this is a public space, uh, can be preserved and achieve what, what it, well, the promises that it made at the beginning, that it would bring humanity closer together and it will be open and, and empowered people around the world. So yes, that's why I'm personally very motivated by the work that we're doing at the other side board. And uh, I'm encouraged. There's still a lot to do. We haven't addressed so much, but I'm really encouraged that at least there is this, this, this conversation is now happening in the public eye. And that makes a huge difference. I love the fact that, you know, um, you guys keep it so grounded and you bring it home and you keep it real. Um, you know, and, and, and for us, I think that gives us huge confidence, right? Um, yeah. So we have just about a minute left. Um, okay. So in, in terms of, um, I, I know that uh, this is quite jam-packed and we have lots of questions. So we're going to try and get them over to you. Uh, if you don't mind actually answer, answering them, that would be great. Um, but just to kind of, you know, uh, round up the conversation, based on your experience, um, how can oversight boards become more effective or more meaningful? Um, yeah. Yes, we have one, we have a few, you know, spots where we're not really good. And, and that's, you know, that's very humble to recognize. Uh, most of our cases came from the United States and Canada. This does not reflect the 
the reality of the user base on the one hand and of the content moderation challenges around the world. So this is something that the Oversight Board is going to work aggressively on in the next few months, making sure that users all around the world, whether you speak French, English, Spanish, Creole, I don't care, whether you speak any language, you, you know that there is this space where even if your case is not taken, the issues that you're trying to point out are really taken seriously by people who spend most of their time now reflecting and trying to find solutions on uh, those specific issues. So this is something that we really want to um, enhance in our, in our practice. And please be aware that we're not making those decisions based only on Facebook community standards because those are flawed, to be very honest. We've identified so many flaws in, in them and, and, and I'm encouraged by the fact that the company wants to perfect them. But we make also our decisions based on international human rights standards and principles. So these are human rights principles that were agreed on by all the countries around the world. All the countries that are member of the United Nations have agreed to those. And the company has committed to respect those and to conduct its business by respecting those human rights. So we are making sure that when the company conducts its business of content moderation, it does not adversely affect the human rights that are very important for us. That's what I wanted to specify. Thank you so very much. I am um, really appreciative of the work that the Oversight Board does um, and you know, making it this tangible uh, and making it all relatable. Um, you know, this gives us hope that you know, big tech actually can be held responsible and be held accountable. Um, so yeah, thank you so very much for your time, for your effort. And um, this is where I hand back over to Mia. Thank you.